Okay. Here it is, September 10, 2024, and welcome everybody um, for attending this BizBuzz event about the Water and Science Administration's climate team. I'm Jim George and work with the WSA Director's Office. WSA's climate team was conceived in 2021. It's composed of volunteers who serve for one year and they devote about 10% of their time to the team. And it just so happens that we'll be recruiting for next year's team very soon. So keep your eye on your email. The team helps to advance climate adaptation and resilience mission of WSA. In short, the mission is to help sure. WSA be prepared for the impacts of the climate change um, and to strive to avoid or lessen those impacts. This mission and related guidance is documented in a July 2020 WSA climate policy memo. And that WSA climate policy is available on WSA's climate adaptation webpage in the left-hand column under highlights. I believe it's also required reading, so check your MS-22 job description. WSA's climate team is composed of three sub-teams, and each of those sub-teams will be presenting today. The first sub-team is to present um, the climate dashboard. That's the climate dashboard sub-team. Over the years, this sub-team has helped to define four climate adaptation priority areas for WSA and more about these in their presentation. This sub-team has also identified specific action items within each of the four priority areas. And in order to present WSA's priorities and action items to the public and to track progress on these act activities, the sub-team developed a web-based dashboard. The public-facing dashboard demonstrates WSA's strong commitment to be accountable for climate adaptation in WSA's routine business functions. The second subteam to present today is the Climate Smart Permitting subteam. This subteam is helping to fulfill WSA's commitment to review all categories of permits, authorizations, licenses, and other regulatory decision instruments. We refer to these as permits for short. These climate smart permit reviews are identifying opportunities to improve WSA's permits to account for climate change. Although these reviews themselves are a major undertaking, a more important undertaking is to adopt these review documents and their findings into existing permitting systems. So today we're calling on WSA's programs to work with the sub team on ensuring that the Climate Smart Permit Reviews are institutionalized within the standard operating procedures that you use to develop your permits or other regulatory decisions. Finally, despite our best efforts to build resilience to climate change impacts, climate change is a threat multiplier. With this understanding in mind, the third and final subteam to present is the Climate Emergency Preparedness subteam. This subteam supplements existing emergency preparedness response and recovery systems that WSA and MDE more broadly have in place. This subteam is striving to build a culture of awareness and knowledge among the rank and file WSA staff to be part of that emergency response system. You'll hear about upcoming climate emergency preparedness training events in their presentation. So with no further delay, let me turn it over to Melissa Knapp of WSA's Wetlands and Waterways program to kick us off with a presentation on WSA's climate adaptation dashboard. I think she'll start presenting now. Yes, thank you, Jim. I'll pop in and to say hi uh, while I get my uh, screen shared. Give me just one moment, please. Okay. 
future. All right, is that full screen? Looks good. Okay, great. All right, well, as Jim said, I'm Melissa Knapp. I'm in the non-tidal wetlands and waterways protection program. Um, I've been on the climate team for the past two years. Um, I'll be giving you a brief introduction to the climate dashboard, what it is, where you can find it, and what type of information it contains. Uh, first, I want to kind of recognize the other members of the dashboard team this year, Samantha, Christina, and Zach. And of course, we all work with Jim as well. The intent of the WSA climate dashboard is twofold. First, to internally track WSA's wide variety of endeavors related to climate adaptation and resilience. And second, to provide a public facing communication, which highlights WSA's commitment to climate adaptation. Um, as a, an extremely brief history, this task began years ago by brainstorming not only what WSA collectively was already doing to address climate change, but also what were the potential opportunities for growth in this area. Um, from this list, themes began to emerge, which Jim talked about, um, and they ultimately led to organizing the activities and items around four priority areas, and I'll introduce those on the next slide. Uh, from this framework, the dashboard team developed simple metrics to display progress toward meeting these goals, and the dashboard webpage went live first as a soft launch at the end of last year, um, with the page fully connected in March of this year. The four priority areas begin with science and planning, which reflects WSA's commitment to ensuring that the responses we make to climate change are evidence-based. Second, we recognize that a large component of WSA's core responsibilities are related to permits and authorizations, licenses, and other regulate, regulatory issues. Um, therefore, taking a page from the EPA and the naming, our second priority area is climate smart water permits. And of course, the permit team will be talking about that in more detail later today. Third, we acknowledge that much of the work we do involves infrastructure, and as such, there's a focus on promoting resilience in traditional infrastructure and expanding the use of green and blue infrastructure where possible. Um, and for those that aren't familiar with the terms green and blue infrastructure, there you can think of them as kind of a nature-based solution, whether it's on land or in the water. Um, and so it's either restoring or enhancing or um, mimicking natural processes for resilience purposes. Um, and finally, we recognize that despite all the efforts going on in the first three priority areas, we do expect more extreme weather events and need to address emergency preparedness and response to ensure that the communities we serve are prepared to handle those situations. I'd like to take this moment to um, just recognize Sam from our team for putting together these graphics, one of which is featured on our climate, climate adaptation page, and the other which is um, going to be used for um, outreach to the regulated community. All right, for the moment, I'm going to stop sharing this screen and go through a demonstration of the climate dashboard. I'm starting first on the water and science main page because if you haven't been here in a while, um, there is a new link on the left sidebar for water and climate change, and that will take you to our climate adaptation page, which outlines uh, kind of the background of what we're doing. There is a nice video here from uh, one of the previous members of the climate team. And it also then links to our dashboard and to some of the accomplishments that we've had. Then if we click through to the dashboard, 
Um, it starts with a description of the climate adaptation priorities with a brief description uh, of each of the four priority areas, and then introduces our summary statistic for the four different priority areas. Um, and then as we progress down the page, we'll find more information about each of them. So you see we've split this out into additional categories and then are quantifying the progress in each of those areas. And this uh, format continues for all four of the priority areas, as you can see here. But we thought people might be interested in more information. So we created some what we're calling detail sheets, which is a PDF that uh, really dives into a lot more detail about what each of these items that we're tracking are. So for each of these PDFs, it will, it'll break it down by category and number them. So these are the six things we're tracking in this category. This is what it's called, whether what its current status is, and provides a brief introduction to um, that topic. So this allows people to really dive into as much information as they like. The fact that these are a PDF allows uh, people to print them out and use them as physical handouts. Um, and that it's really keeping us um, on our toes and making sure that everyone is aware of what we're doing. Um, I'm going to switch back to our presentation here. All right. So at the moment, we have semi-annual updates, which requires coordination with program managers and other climate subteams. As you can imagine, uh, the, the spreadsheets on the right-hand side are just to kind of illustrate the amount of tracking that's going on in relation to these priority areas. Um, so it takes a lot of detailed work to make sure that all of the information in the various resources match up and are updated uh, at the same time. So our future work will involve uh, kind of trying to simplify this process a little bit, improve linking between documents, and hopefully uh, consider automation down the line. So this is my little plug for you to consider joining the uh, climate team if you're interested in this sort of nitty gritty detail background work. And with that, I will turn it back over to Jim. Okay, I'll round out uh, the dashboard team presentation uh, by describing some of the activities of the 2024 team and where we're going in the future. Um, as Melissa mentioned, we had our official launch of the uh, dashboard page in March. Um, we coordinated some updates of the page with the Office of Communications. And then in June of 2024, we had our first update um, of the information. Um, Melissa is in the process of developing uh, standard operating procedures for the update process. Um, and she did mention we're doing a recruiting of the next uh, group of uh, climate team volunteers. And we'd really like somebody who has an interest in maintaining this system for a year. So if there's anybody out there that has some skill sets that could handle um, that type of thing, um, let myself or Melissa know, and of course, let your supervisor know that you're interested, because we'd like to start um, on-the-job training uh, this October when we do our November update. Um, and then we're preparing some documents for distribution via social media. You saw that infographic that Samantha Baylog did um, as an example. Next slide, please. So um, we're also putting together some new content. Um, one is a, a set of uh, videos. We're starting with an overview video that we hope to 
uh, complete this year that gives an overview of the four priority areas. And um, then we also want to do more community engagement um, through social media, as well as um, through newsletters and other um, means of letting people know um, that Maryland has this dashboard and providing them a link to it. Um, next slide, please. So future teams, um, we hope we'll continue working on the videos. We'll only finish the overview this year, but we'll do four videos covering each of the four priority areas next year. Um, and then we also are thinking about some upgrades to the web page itself. Um, we want to continue our community engagement next year as well. And um, then we also recognize that the um, activity areas are not static. Um, in addition to updating just the progress of the existing um, action items, we want to consider additional um, climate initiatives. Um, we had some that we had to pass over when we put this um, dashboard together. Some of those um, were challenging to get to the finish line, so we kind of dropped them off the list, but we might consider those um, next year. Next slide, or is this the last one? That's the last one. Okay, great, Melissa. So that wraps it up for this um, sub-team. The next sub-team um, is the Climate Smart Permit sub-team, and Miles Simmons, that sub-team, will be presenting. He's also with the, the wetlands program, so the wetlands program is well represented here today. Miles, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Jim. Um, thank you, Melissa. That was great. My name is Miles Simmons. I am a natural resource planner with the Wetlands and Waterways Protection Program in the uh, Tidal Wetlands Division. Let me share my screen here. All right, can everybody see that? Hopefully so. Um, All right, so um, as uh, Jim said, um, I'm part of the uh, the permit sub team, and I have been uh, fortunate to work with the other members listed here: uh, Troy, Christina, Melinda, Bethany, and Zach. And uh, a special thank you to Bethany for putting together this this presentation. Stand by, folks, having a slight technical difficulties. Okay, I think we got it here. So, um, motivations for the Climate Smart Permits sub team. Um, MDE WSA is in a uniquely position, is uniquely positioned to have an impact on building climate change resilience because it has the policing powers reflected in our permitting authorities, uh, our external stakeholders expect us to use our enviro superpowers for good. Uh, and this matters because climate change is water change from a scientific perspective. Remember the hydrologic, hydrologic cycle, you know, it all comes back to, to water eventually. So for WSA's Climate Smart Permit Initiative, we want to know how can we enhance WSA permits and the permitting process to ensure climate change resilience? The slide answers that question. Um, essentially, we have uh, developed a three-level review methodology where we cycle through all of the approximately 40 approvals over time in three phases. And each phase considers an increasing level of effort needed. Um, you know, we start off with communications, informing the regulated community and stakeholders about climate change permit issues. Um, and our level one review consists of immediate best professional judgment changes that can be made with current authority and without extensive research. 
Uh, level two review is research-driven changes that can be made with the current authority and additional research. And then level three review being our new regulation-driven uh, changes that can be made with revisions to the regulatory authority, certainly the um, most challenging of, of the three levels. Um, currently, we are in uh, the level one review phase of things. And part of that, um, again, you know, communication, essentially the the low hanging fruit um you know what can we do without having to do the additional research um and without changing our regulations and so for example um we look at um informing the regulated community um for uh, the acknowledgement letters that we send out for our wetland applications um it's a simple routine piece of correspond correspondence but in that letter, we use it to raise awareness about the responsibilities that the applicant has to account for climate change. In particular, licensed engineers to have professional duties that extend beyond simply following the regulations. How are they planning for climate change? Um, and especially in the, the wetland side of things, you know, relative sea level rise, storm events, et cetera. Uh, again, most of our effort to date has been focused on the level one reviews. Um, but there are a few exceptions. The permit level one review tool updates by the 2024 team include updating the permit tracking spreadsheet, uh, making that a little bit more streamlined um, and easier for those of us that might not be dealing with this on a regular basis to follow as well as uh, updating the level one review guidance documents. This shows the overall progress we've had since 2021. Uh, communications should be tracking a little bit closer with level one reviews. You know, we are communicating uh, as, as we proceed through level one reviews. We are being more intentional about communications in our reviews, but including recommendations uh, about how to enhance communications about, sorry, let me start that over. So um, we are being more intentional about communications in our reviews by including recommendations about how to enhance communications about climate adaptation. Our level one reviews, in addition to setting up the permit review framework, the climate team's focus has been on level one reviews. Level two and level three reviews are happening naturally in some cases. Um, climate change is being considered in the context to revisions of the water appropriations and use regulations and Maryland stormwater management regulations. In the latter case, you might have heard about a storm advancing stormwater resiliency in Maryland. A storm is driven by part, in part, by state legislation, Senate Bill 227 adopted in 2021. And again, there, there's some that, you know, some of these permits that we've reviewed don't really, there's not much to address as far as climate change. Uh, example is a swimming pools permit. There's not too much about a swimming pool permit that's gonna be affected by climate change other than the fact that people might want to go swimming in a pool more frequently when it gets too stinking hot in the summer. But I digress. Um, so our 2024 team progress, level one reviews completed, as you can see below. Um, we have researched, evaluated impacts of climate variability and provided written recommendations for the following permits below. Responding to the workload challenge. Um, we have a lot of permits to go through and review, um, you know, approximately 40 permit categories in all. We do have EPA support. We've reached out for EPA assistance. Um, first, we sought funding to hire consulting services. EPA offered staff support to conduct level one reviews. This has accelerated the process significantly. EPA has also invited MDE to present 
on our Climate Smart Initiative at a number of forums. We always make a pitch to other states to collaborate with us. Uh, as part of that, it, you know, a multi-state shared effort. We have floated the idea of spreading the workload among multiple states. This could be done through the Association of Clean Water Administrators. The work could be divided among subgroups. For example, three states could assess opportunities for municipal wastewater discharge permits and combine their findings into a review mem memo. And then grant funding. Um, we have sought grant funding uh, through a couple different sources. Uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act had some, some grant funding available uh, to hire consulting services to conduct climate smart permit reviews for WSA's permits. Uh, NOAA's Climate Resilience Regional Challenge Grant uh, for two full-time employees uh, adding up to about 1.5 million over five years. Um, however, no luck yet on the grant funding efforts. I don't expect everyone to read through all of this here, um, but these are the EPA level one reviews initiated in 2024. EPA has initiated reviews and provided written information to us. The climate team, including next year's team, needs to finalize some of these reviews in the form of a standardized memo that identifies potential opportunities for enhancing our permits and permitting processes including communications with permittees and other stakeholders. MDE still needs to digest some of EPA's reviews and formalize the findings in a level one review memo. And uh, we've been working with uh, Matt Confers to EPA's region three climate change lead. Matt has been very helpful in the process thus far. And as far as what's next, we're going to continue to follow up with the EPA reviews, um, continue with the wetlands level one review, going to incorporate level one review into development of the Maryland State Programmatic General Permit 7. The current general permit is set to expire September 30th, 2026. So those discussions are going to be starting up here soon. Uh, we want to coordinate with appropriate WSA programs institutionalize the level one review memos, uh, and also develop guidance and tools for programs to use when updating permits. And lastly, continue our level one reviews. Um, that concludes my portion of the presentation. And uh, at this time, I would like to introduce Miranda Salters, who will be presenting the Climate Emergency Preparedness sub team stop sharing now all right thank you so much can everybody hear me i um, just want to make sure okay great thank you um so yes i'm miranda salters um and i'm a part of the this year's climate matrix team specifically climate emergency preparedness um, and also response um, I am an NRP in the lead in drinking water division, specifically lead in schools, which is in the water supply program. So a little different than wetlands and waterways, but um, I think that my position in lead in drinking water pairs really well with the climate team and specifically climate emergencies because of the link with public health. Um, so it's been uh, really great to kind of supplement uh, my regular position uh, with this climate emergency pre and preparedness work. So I will share my screen. Okay. All right, can everyone see that all right? Cool, all right. So again, we are the Climate Emergency Preparedness subteam, um, and that's our abbreviation up there. Um, and our team consists of Amy, Tony, uh, Cameron, who's now a part of the Air and Radiation Administration, but she's been really helpful with our uh, recent projects, and also Zachary. So just to provide a little bit of background, I know Jim kind of introduced 
um, how climate change um, awareness should be incorporated into our daily work, but a little bit of a bigger uh, perspective. So um, more emergencies in the future are occurring as a changing climate drives extreme weather, sea level rise, rising groundwater tables, and more frequent th freeze and thaw cycles. And I also wanted to add uh, more frequent um, and extreme droughts, which I know the water um, water supply program uh, deals with uh, yearly. So these wreak havoc on infrastructure and public health. And in more of a, a financial um, lens, these, um, these no notes right here kind of show uh, the cost that climate change has had um, from 1980 to 2022. So drought and heat wave events have caused the most deaths um, with severe storms having the most financial burden um, on the country as a whole. Um, and obviously we're in Maryland, so we have to talk about this, the perspective uh, from a Maryland point of view. So Maryland has spent an estimated 10 to $20 billion in climate disaster costs um, during that same time frame, And specifically inland flooding is projected to increase by 50% by 2050. And as you can imagine, due to Maryland's 3,000 miles of coastline, um, this makes our state particularly vulnerable to flooding, saltwater intrusion, um, and other related issues that in turn lead to displacement of those coastal communities. Um, so that will lead us into the four climate adaptation priority areas. So I know uh, Melissa discussed these a little bit, but just to go over them again. Um, so the first one, and again, these are in, um, in this specific order intentionally, um, closing it out with emergency response because that's kind of the last stitch effort um, to appropriately respond to these emergency events. But when it comes to leveraging science and planning, um, the goal is to adjust and adapt water programs and policy decisions to ensure that they account for climate change related issues and the subsequent costs on public welfare and infrastructure that follow. And then climate smart permitting, we heard about that one. Um, but again, reviewing uh, regulatory approval procedures and permits um, from the lens of sustainable management and climate change awareness is especially important. Um, and then resilient green, blue, and traditional water infrastructure. Um, so for this one, it's important to accelerate the implementation of green, blue, and also traditional infrastructure to enhance resilience which will hopefully in turn promote sustainable water management um, and support the health and longevity of our communities. And then finally, our group, where our group comes into the picture um, with emergency preparedness and response, our focus is updating and exercising response procedures to safeguard public health, water resources, and critical infrastructure from the rising impacts of climate change. So some of our team's goals, our first goal is we wanna help ensure that the Water and Science Administration is prepared to respond to emergencies that have potential water resource impacts. Um, and in addition, through this work, um, we hope to promote staff awareness of the wide spectrum of roles that MDE plays. Um, even though we're just talking about water and science, the Water and Science Administration um, today, there are so many different programs and roles within that that play a crucial part in um, climate change action and resilience and response. Um, and then to kind of materialize these things, we're gonna be conducting training events um, where we also hope to build a culture of emergency avoidance and preparedness, like I said, and improve networking amongst our programs so that we can all understand our individual um, roles kind of in this effort. So we have our training initiatives and events. So for our webinars, we are going to be holding two one-hour training webinars 
in addition to one three hour kind of larger training workshop, a little more interactive. Um, and specifically, um, I know a lot of you were able to make it to the dam safety um, workshop, or sorry, the dam safety webinar, um, which was in person in addition to virtual. And I will also have a link for that if you were not able to attend. Um, so we'll have that one. And then coming up in September, on September 24th, we have a public health related event, which is specifically going to incorporate um, the shellfish management program um, of WSA. So we're really excited for that one. Amy is taking the lead on that one. Um, so we're really excited to have that. And so to look back on our uh, first event that we've had, so Dam Safety Inspection and Compliance Division was represented at this uh, training. Um, Charlie Wallace, the division chief, uh, presented to us how dam safety um, is incorporated in climate change um, planning and resilience. And to just kind of, and he kind of gave us just an overview of what they do and how their um, work uh, can be like translated into a climate change sense and how they respond to different emergencies. Um, so discussing how individual dams, uh, dam owners are developing action plans um, and how to handle varying disasters depending on that dam's hazard rating, which I thought was really interesting. I wasn't aware of that, um, that role that they have. So we have a link over here, which Jim can also probably send or I can send it um, if anyone's interested in uh, viewing that presentation. Um, and then finally, our larger workshop. The theme is going to be about the key bridge collapse and the recovery process. So although this doesn't necessarily link exactly to climate change events, this is a case, this should be like a case study um, to show how MDE and our partners respond to such catastrophic events similar to those that um, can be created through, from climate change. Um, so this event will be kind of a two-part series. So we will have a one-hour poster session to summarize each program's role in climate resilience um, and preparedness. Again, trying to target that networking aspect and an understanding of how all of our programs are interconnected. And then on the same day, we will have a two-hour workshop with a guest speaker, which we're really excited about to discuss um, Keybridge um, and the response and everything involved with that. Um, so we're excited to get another perspective from an expert. And again, this event will be on October 30th and more information will be coming about that. And also an invite uh, and more information will be coming about our other um, event, which is on September 24th. So um, another one of our larger tasks is um, maintaining emergency response standard operating, standard operating procedures, making sure that every program is updating those um, by May 30th annually. So I know I uh, played a big role in going through the um, shared drive, making sure that each program's um, emergency SOPs were updated and all of the contacts and different links and resources were updated um, to ensure that we're incorporating um, climate resiliency and into our standard operating procedures. And then you'll notice we have um, after hours um, procedures. So those come from the Maryland Department of Emergency Response of Emergency Management, um, MDEM to uh, Water and Science Administration's compliance program, where those duty officers then direct the issues to the appropriate WSA um, program as needed. So again, this is to ensure consistent decision-making across the board, um, ensuring that all programs are on the same page and addressing uh, climate change as an issue within their scope of work. So for our next steps, um, 
So our group um, hopes to incorporate other WSA programs in our future training events. So similarly to how we've um, incorporated dam safety and soon to be um, shellfish management, we hope to um, involve more programs so that we can gain a wider range of perspectives um, on how climate change impacts our water resources and also our the resilience, uh, Maryland's resilience than water resources. And then our next um, goal is we hope to like incorporate and explore environmental justice elements and awareness into emergency preparedness and response um, with Maryland's wide spectrum of communities from the Eastern shore to the DC metro area, to Baltimore, to the Western part of Maryland in more mountainous regions. It's crucial that we gain an understanding of how different communities of different locations and different socioeconomic status are impacted by climate change emergencies so that MDE can respond appropriately. And then finally, um, sorry, finally, um, we hope to leverage partnerships perhaps with other government agencies um, and even maybe partner with other um, programs outside of WSA. So those are our next goals. And yeah, we're excited for the new uh, climate team next year. So thank you so much. Bring it back to Jim. Thank you, Miranda. Um, I really appreciated your presentation and your uh, attention to detail, giving attribution for the images, which we're all required to do. Um, we sometimes forget to do that. So that's really great. Um, and thanks again to Melissa Knapp, Miles uh, Simmons uh, for your presentations. And a special shout out to Melinda Cutler, who has been really doing a lot of the heavy lifting, um, coordinating the um, Climate Smart Permitting sub team uh, work with EPA. It's been really uh, crucial and much appreciated. Um, so I'll open it up now for any questions or comments people um, want to share. Um, you can just, I guess, raise your hand and go off uh, mute and ask questions if you have any. The silence is deafening. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, oh. Michael. Hi, um, this question, I guess, goes back to the um, permitting subgroup or sub team um, present part of the presentation. And I saw your step three was about regulation change, but um, as part of that, are you considering actually that legislation might be needed because regulations or current laws to be more specific, just aren't, don't have, aren't authorizing enough to make the changes you're looking for? Yes, uh, we we kind of uh, acknowledge when, when we put that uh, level three review, it really should be legislation and regulation. Um, we didn't really want to have four levels, um, so you're right. Sometimes we actually have to change the law itself to have the authority to do things. So good point, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. And Michael's, um, his staff in particular, Paul Vlanka, who works on uh, some of the general permits for stormwater, um, has been particularly helpful um, over the last year, year and a half. So a shout out to that group. They're kind of leading the way, to be honest. So we appreciate that. Any other questions? Michael. Yeah, I guess I had a follow up for that. It was just it just occurred to me, um, I guess, back on your level two, which I think somewhat involved um, policy or maybe that was more your level one. I know MDE in, in particular regarding um, precipitation um, and how it affects stormwater has um, policies in place that actually need to be updated. Um, 
So I guess it would be good to hear what the team is considering about how, how to get those updated, because those are actually huge lifts to get those documents updated. Right. Um, well, the level two, the level one, the whole idea of the three levels is we want to be able to do the easy things quickly. If we wait to do research, it could be years before we make any uh, updates to our permitting process, procedures. And as you probably know, Michael, um, Yender with the municipal um, wastewater discharge permit was part of kind of a somewhat informal um, level one review in which he had several ideas that were pretty rapidly adopted into your permitting process. Um, and, but there are things that when you're doing a level one review, you kind of say, well, here's another issue, but that's going to take some study. And the example you give of changing um, the estimated stormwater patterns, how much it rains over what period of time, or the, the, the size of storms, is the type of studying that's being done and adopted through the A-storm um, process. So they're effectively doing some work in the level two type of review area as well as level three because they're going through, you know, Jennifer Smith and her team are going through the process of actually changing their regulations to be able to um, then in turn change how the permits are issued and, and plan reviews are conducted and that type of thing. Um, it's, it's a little bit organic the way it's happening there, but that research is occurring um, and we're giving them credit for it through this, um, um, through our dashboard system. So some of, some of what's going on is organic. Um, but one of the challenges that we have is when we do our level one reviews, we, we run into things we're saying, well, that's gonna take more thought. But what we try to do is, is document it. So that memo is sitting around and if somebody were to look at it, um, and what we should do is look at it and think about, okay, what, which of those issues that require more study should we um, identify resources for and actually get get the, the those studies done. So there is a there is a, an important follow up that we need to do. Um, that um, I'll be honest with you, we're focusing mostly on just you know getting the the ball rolling and doing these level one reviews, but we don't want to uh, take our eye off the ball and forget to follow up. And so that's where I was talking about institutionalizing these memos into the existing permitting frameworks that you all have so that um, future permit writers know those memos exist and take a look at them when it's time for them to update their permits or even before that because if we're going to be doing we need to do some studies um, you know we'll want to get the ball rolling on those studies not sure that answers your question thanks michael anyone else Okay, well, I want to encourage folks, if you haven't seen the WSA policy memo, to take a look at it. It really does invite um, all staff to uh, be proactive with regard to um, climate change initiatives within your area of work. Um, so go ahead and, and take a look at that. Raise issues with your supervisor if you think there are improvements that we can make in our daily business routines. Um, and also another um, pitch for um, volunteers for next year, keep your eyes open for our invitation uh, to be part of this climate team process. And any of the team members have anything you wanna say before we call it a session? If not, we'll give you back 10 oh oh thanks amanda we'll give you back 10 minutes amanda is a, is an alumni of uh the climate team so thank you uh and um enjoy the rest of uh, your lunch if <laughs> if uh oh i guess it'd be a little late for that all right folks take care now thanks again for joining us
Bye-bye.